Hey, what's going on, TLC? Is your boy PT coming at you with the word of the week. Um, this week's story is Georgia shooting analysis as Asian hate crimes increases in America, All right? So there has been an increased report of Asian hate crimes in our country, 149 specifically percent an increase from 2019 all the way to 2020. And that's the only ones that are being actually reported because most of the time there's a sense of just stay quiet and deal mentality in the Asian community. So um, in the news, man, we, we hear of horrific stories of elderly people being attacked on the streets unprovoked. Uh, we, we hear stories like an elderly woman struck in the face while waiting at a bus station or an elderly man uh, hit with a metal rod while he's at the uh, subway station, right? And then last week we, we heard uh, Georgia shooting at three, there's a Georgia mass shooting at three spas, eight died, six of which were Asian women. And this whole shooting reignited the, the cry against Asian American hate crimes in this country, right? And what we saw on the, the internet and then social media was just this tidal wave of support, tidal wave of just a rallying cry of, you know, what well, we got to really fight this, right? And they really wanted to specifically be clear about this Georgia shooting that they want the words to be clear that this was a hate crime against Asians. And this is a story I want to kind of focus on for today's word of the week, the, the shooting in Georgia. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of things right off the bat that I need to make sure that we get clear. Okay. One, there is a definite increase in Asian hate crimes in this country. Numbers don't lie. Okay. Numbers tell the truth. 149% increase. That's guaranteed. That's for sure. Secondly, the mass shooting in Georgia is a horrific crime. Mass shooting of any kind is a horrific crime, period, okay? Even as I'm sharing with you today, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the news of um, the Colorado Boulder shooting uh, that's happening right now. 10 people died, okay? Now, but what, what made me want to talk about the mass shooting in Georgia a little more, though, okay? Because what I see among people on social media was when this, this shooting happened was a conflation of two stories into one in order to, to push for a specific narrative that, that that is important, but also very popular at the same time. So here in this case, we see six Asian women were killed by a gunman in three different spas, right? And there's been two, a huge spike in Asian hate crimes in America. Therefore, narrative goes, this shooting is an Asian hate crime that we need to draw attention to, okay? Let me break that down real fast for you guys. First, is it true that there's a huge spike in Asian hate crimes in America? Yes, 100% true, okay? Two, do we need to draw attention to the Asian hate crimes against Asians in America? 100%, we need to draw attention to that because it's it's happening. Three, did this man kill these women specifically only because they were Asians? Not too sure, right? And to say and to claim that the motive of this man was simply a hate against Asians is, I don't think, a big enough picture of what's actually going on here. I think we do a disservice to the context of the bigger story when we jump reflexively to a narrative that is mainstream at the moment, right? So don't get me wrong. This is definitely a hate crime. Yet what I'm trying to say is I think this is a hate crime against sex workers and not necessarily against Asians. I think he targeted the sex working establishment and the people who were there happened to be Asians. Those two things can be true at the same time, right? So here's, here's what we know from the news. And okay? one, the shooter has a history of sexual addiction. As a pastor, reading about his Christian upbringing uh, and the language that was used, it, it, it is a very clear red flag that he suffered from a huge weight of shame and guilt and darkness uh, that goes on in a young man's life when uh, sexual sins becomes a prevalent thing and, and, it, and you don't have the cr correct Christian outlet to... Uh, navigate that, you can be just bombarded with this weight of shame, right? And I've counseled people that echoed very similar thoughts that this young man echoed in his, uh, in, 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 in these um, articles, right? Um, secondly, from an addiction standpoint, his frequenting of these massage parlors can be seen as a relapse in his sexual addiction. You know, he has, he did go to therapy. He was in the clinic. He, he did try to seek help. And you know it would work for a time, and then he would relapse into these sex, uh, these massage parlors. Okay, another thing. Three, these three massage parlors are known to be areas of happy endings and prostitution. 
Okay. According to the Washington Post I read, there's a website where you can go on and anonymously review massage parlors all over the country. Okay. And these reviews would have people, they'll be able to write about the race of the workers in the massage parlors. These anonymous reviewers would be able to tell you the breast size of the workers, the specific names to ask for if you happen to go to these places. And they would rate these massage parlors on a star basis, five being she was amazing, she was wonderful, one being she was expressionist and clinical in her service, okay? And for these three massage parlors that were shot up, over 200 reviews as recent as 2019 were given to these parlors, right? Also, from 2011 to 2013, police have rated these specific massage parlors on crimes of prostitution. Fourthly, the shooter confessed that the motive of his killing was that he saw these establishments that he frequented as places of his temptation. These are the parlors that he went to that he, that he was known to visit. He didn't visit the strip club that was around the corner. He attacked the place where he felt where he was most tempted and he and he used as his, as his conduit of relapse, right? And so he saw that and he, and, he, and, he, and he went out and he attacked that place, okay? So this is definitely a hate crime, 100%. But at the heart of this, I think it's a hate crime against sex workers, not necessarily against Asians, right? Uh, and that, that might be an unpopular thought, or not, but that's just me trying to uh, put some um, context into this story. So here's my, here's my pastoral um, word in regards to this, okay? First thing, believers need to seek truth in context, okay? There needs to be a discipline among believers again for context. At least take the word of James in the letter that he writes to the church where he says, be slow to speak and be quick to listen. But before you jump on this bandwagon of just screaming these ideals, take a moment and listen and read and figure out the context. Because just as it's dangerous to read the Bible without context, it's just as dangerous to jump on a narrative without context, right? When we want the Bible to say something so badly, we, we, we will, we'll, we'll read it and we'll, without context, we'll just make something up we actually miss out on what God actually wants to say to us. And oftentimes we would tell people that God said something that he did not. And that's very, very dangerous. In the same way, when, we, when you want a narrative to be something so bad, we miss out on another narrative that's just as important and need to, as much attention. And in this case, the narrative is the exploitation of sex in this industry, right? And the things I, I understand why the wanting to make the, the Asian hate crime a, a, a loud narrative because, man, like one, there's, there's a huge rise in percentage of hate, Asian hate um, crimes in America. Elderly people are getting hurt and, and there are elderly people, they don't usually fight back. So it's really horrible, right? Um, and you can imagine all these years of just Asians being told to keep their head down or being the model citizens and toeing the line of, 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 of um, of, of being uh, in line of, you know, what it means to be just whatever, right? Now we're the object of hate among people and it's just ridiculous to kind of keep quiet. You want to say something and I, and I get that, 100% I get that. But to conflate the story as hate crime against Asian misses the story of hate crimes against so sex workers. And so you gotta, as a believer, you gotta be able to pause and be patient and to see a story in context, to seek the truth in context, okay? Number two, Christians need to see the evil of sex trafficking, of the, of the sex trafficking industry and work to eradicate it. The sex trafficking industry is a real evil that has just blinded our nation, our country. It's, and I'm not, I'm not for a moment victim blaming these sex workers, okay, at all, right? They are by no means to blame, okay? Um, their, their sisters, their mothers, their daughters, who for a lot of uh, people, are, for a lot of times, are ridiculously placed in a situation that leads them down this road that they had to do these things. A lot of the sex trafficking industry brings young girls from China and South Korea on the promise of work, then through means of racking up debt, they are forced to work in this industry to pay off these debts. And they can't speak a single lick of English. They're afraid of the system. And so they're more afraid of being caught and being arrested than they are of actually doing these crimes. You know, so we need to point the finger, not we need to not point the fingers at 
sex workers, but rather fight the $150 billion industry that's dealing with sex trafficking in our country of women and children, okay? Um, one day I'll talk about more how we can do that, but today I just wanna just kind of throw that out there, you know? We need to see that there's an evil in this sex trafficking industry. Okay. Thirdly, believers need to be transparent in our conversation about sexual addiction. See, there's a taboo about sex that has dominated the Christian faith. And these taboos created spaces where, where, where brothers and sisters, they can't, they can't share. They feel judged if they share, or they feel scared to share. What if people actually saw me for what I am, for what I think, right? And this leads to uh, Christians dealing with their addictions alone, privately. And that has never been a good deal whatsoever, okay? And not only do you deal with it alone and privately, you create facades of who you are. Instead of finding freedom to grow and be transformed, you find yourself hidden and hiding and actually more ashamed of yourself. What we need are brothers and sisters to help create spaces to teach young men and young women how to nurture real relationships rather than to create counterfeit relationships through sex. Pornography, erotic novels, those are counterfeit ways of how you deal with relationships. Happy endings, prostitutions, again, counterfeit ways of having relationship. See, the Christian life is about nurturing true loving relationships with your neighbors, with those around you, with, with brothers and sisters. And we need to create spaces to create those and nurture those relationships again, okay? And so my, my word today is, is very simple. Yes, we got we to gotta jump into these stories and we got to be a little bit wiser about them, okay? Um, we got to deal with the problem that shows up and not just conflate stories together. And we need to be transparent in our lives, I mean, especially when it comes to sexual addiction, all right? Uh, that's the word for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it and hope it was uh, beneficial for you. All right, peace out. Like what you see? Come check us out on our YouTube channel. We're called to love God, love people, and serve the world. We post regularly every week, Wednesdays and Sundays. 10 a.m. Children's Ministry, 12.30 p.m. for English Ministry. Check out our website at www.wearetruelove.com. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button 